Excellent. We're all excited to be here? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So who wants to learn about the death machine of the ancient world? Yep. Woo! Yes. All righty. So uh, my name is Noah Fowler. I'm a Roman Green actor with the 11th Claudium Legion. Uh, we're based out of Peachtree City, Georgia. So all my Georgia folks represent. So um, what I do is first century AD Roman legionary impressions. Um, and not, not like, you know, funny impressions like, haha, like more like, hey, this is what I'm wearing. This is how we kill people. Um, plain and simple, the Roman army back in the day was uh, a very effective war machine. Obviously, uh, they conquered much, much of the known world back then um, with an empire at their height expanding all the way from Scotland to the banks of the Euphrates River. Um, so, today's panel will be uh, a little bit of a change up from some of you might be returning, you know, returning from uh, previous ones because I might see one or two familiar faces in here. Um, so, last year we had Evan doing it. Um, he is an open book. He is uh, a man who can tell you absolutely anything and everything. There is no about Rome. I myself, I'm uh, partial to, again, the, the Principate era, which is, of course, um, the first century AD primarily um, for my time frame. Uh, so we're going to be going over basic equipment and whatnot uh, regarding the soldier. But uh, today we'll be focusing on how that equipment came into play with those formations and their, and their battle drills, so to speak, um, whenever it came down to fighting the war. So um, I have a Gallic volunteer who is kitted out. Um, we'll call him, we'll call him Boagrius, if anybody knows who that is. Boagrius! Nobody's watched Troy? <laughs> oh, hell yeah. Everybody give a round of applause for Andrew. Yeah. Right, so Andrew here was much like yourself. He was very interested in ancient Rome, and he came to this panel a few years ago and saw myself, and he's like, man, that's a handsome-looking man. <laughs> okay, so he didn't, he didn't say that. He said, that's a handsome looking kid. So he decided he would approach me and, and you know, be a volunteer for today. So um, Andrew, again, uh, is very new to this. So um, he's being my body for today. So again, just one more round of applause for him. <laughs> this stuff is not light. It's not light. So, all right, so uh, before we get into the nitty gritty, I'm going to go ahead and introduce a bit of his kit here. Um, on his head is the Gallic F. It is a helmet uh, introduced in the late first century BC early first century AD, you'll notice that there is a great deal of protection provided for the cheeks, um, the head, the ears, and the back of the neck. Um, so a good majority of his face and head is covered. Um, it is not like medieval plate armor or anything like that, um, more, of the, more of the helmets you might be seeing around here and some of the knights that are using. Um, the helmet here um, is designed in a modular way to provide ample vision, um, the ability to hear, but also protection for all the parts that matter. Um, so. You might notice his face is, of course, exposed. And the reason for that is he has this, but we'll get into that here in a minute. So again, we have the cheek to cover, of course, his cheeks. So the cheek plates are there for that. Um, one of the things I really want to note here is the brow band. Um, that was incorporated in the, um, the Montefortino helmets and the, the early Cassis, or yeah, Cassis D, or the coolest Ds, excuse me, of uh, the late Republican era um, because swords were going straight through helmets. So this brow band was there to, of course, reinforce that um, to a degree. Um, and er, or different types of Gallic helmets, you notice that there might be wings or what looks like dolphins or so on. Um, that actually was there and introduced to, um, instead of the metal would split, it would crimple like a soda can, opposed to um, the split right in half and splinter uh, iron into your head. So, of course, the neck as well provides neck protection with this, uh, with this bowed out um, piece back here. So if you would not turn around for me, Andrew. So you notice he has ample protection on the back of the neck. Um, between the armor itself and uh, all the vital parts there. Um, of course, your back isn't really going to be showing to the enemy. If it is, something's wrong. <laughs> um, so, but that also is, is, again, just there, just in case. Everything everything you see on this man, except for his shield, is an incidental. incidental excuse me. That's right, so if you want to turn it up for me. All right, so the next thing you'll see is that he has riveted a uh, male called Lorca Hamada. All right, now you might hear the term Lorca uh, thrown around. Uh, just simply means armor in Latin. The actual terminology used for this is uh, subjective and up, up for debate between the scholars of um, ancient history. Um, so they just use the Latin terms from classical Latin and incorporated their own um, anachronism as they have to be called. But it is mentioned that Lorca Mata is riveted male from uh, early manuscripts and um, annals written by you know people such as Tacitus and uh, Suetonius and so on. Um, but you'll notice that it's doubled up in the shoulders here. Uh, again, this is to provide uh, more protection. But you'll notice um, some of you may know already that male is not there to protect from stabbing. It's not there to protect from Anything like that. This is again an incidental from slashing blows, um, because bones break, of course. While it might uh, male does pierce uh, with enough force, I've tested this myself. 
Um, but at the same time, it breaks, it breaks bones if it does not pierce anyway. So this is uh, more so for slashing. The segmented armor called Lorca Segmentata, which I unfortunately do not have a demonstration um, at present here uh, for today, is a segmented armor that goes down to about midway to the shoulders and a segmented cuirass that goes down to the waist. Um, again, there are varying types of Roman armor, but here we have the Lorca Armada. Um, on his belt, you'll see the Baltius. This is the Roman army legionary belt. Um, the apron here, some, some might speculate that it provides protection for the groin. That's not the case. This is simply a decorative piece, so that way he's got some bling. <laughs> <laughs> because whenever they're under arms, um, the, the Romans had a version of posse comitatatus. If anybody knows what that is, that's where the United States Army can't, or the United States military in general, cannot come under arms into capital cities and enforce uh, martial law without due cause and so on and so forth. Rome had the same kind of law. So in order to designate and denote their soldiers from the civilian populace, they only were permitted to wear these boots called the Caligae and this Baltius, right? So there was no standardization of tunics. Um, contrary to popular belief, they didn't really wear just uh, red tunics um, and in a uniform sense. The only uniformity you saw among them was that they had standard issue equipment, being their um, iron helmet, their iron armor, their shield, and of course their sword. Those were, that was the equipment that was issued to them. Their tunics and such, uh, they provided or they uh, acquired at their own leisure or through their own dispensation. So, um, again, this is all for bling purposes. Um, post first century, you see the removal of this apron, for reasons I personally do not know, uh, perhaps other scholars may be able to tell you. Um, but the Baltius is, again, a decorative piece. This is a very simple Baltius. Most of them will have ornaments uh, pertinent to their family heritage or what they've done in battle or awards or, or so on. Uh, you may notice he has a dagger here. This is called the Pugio. All right, the Pugio is um, also, contrary to popular belief, it is not uh, necessarily a weapon. This is more so a utility knife um, that soldiers purchased uh, with their own pay. Um, so it wasn't issued to them, and they mainly used this to carve bread, uh, you know, maybe make a little duck or something like that. I don't know if they made ducks. <laughs> but, you know, when you're bored and you have sharp things, why not play with it? So better, better be this than not that. Um, but again, a utility knife in all seriousness. Um, under, underneath the armor, he has a gambeson called a subarmalus. Um, you are not really able to see it, um, but basically it's another tunic just doubled up on the shoulders to provide uh, some padding between himself and the armor. Um, not really much protection there. Um, earlier examples of the subarmalus, uh, some of them might actually be leather. Again, doubled up on the shoulders, usually with a uh, wool. Um, so most of their tunics were typically, a lot of the fabric in ancient Rome was made from wool and linen. Those were the two primary, uh, primary fabrics that they had available to them back then. Um, so it is, all, it is all pertinent to environment as well. Um, some may believe and hear that the Romans didn't wear pants. Um, that's actually not true. Uh, whenever they're in a northern environment and they're sitting on Hadrian's Wall and that English winter comes, you know, the thought going through his head is, man, I don't know about your girl. No, it's cold as fuck. I'm gonna wear some. I'm gonna wear some pants. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what they did was they looked to the locals, and of course the northern Europeans. They they were known for wearing those barbarian trousers and whatnot. For for some god awful reason, you know, pants were considered barbaric up until the fact that the army went in the one in the north and all of a sudden whenever Rome's warriors were wearing it, it was like, oh, all of a sudden it's cool now, you know? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, uh, so what you see here is probably what you would see um, on the Italian peninsula or around um, Greece and so on where it gets hot and it stays in a temperate, um, temperate climate. Um, of course, uh, you want to minimize whenever you're in a hotter environment what kind of fabric you're wearing. So of course, he's uh, very much exposed in that regard. But the cloth is, again, uh, purely there to, again, cover all the important bits and some wing wings. So, um, you notice on his feet, this is very interesting. Um, this is called the Caligai. This is a Castleford pattern. Uh, or actually, correction, it's a Valkenburg uh, pattern, which means they found the design at Valkenburg, Germany. Um, but the interesting part about the Caligai and the boots of the Roman army, um, which they did have closed toe as well, I'll get to that here in a minute, um, was that they had studded hobnails on the bottom. So, if Andrew, if you would raise your feet for them. Um, these were the cleats of back in the day, right? Um, they had these studs on the back of them to provide grip um, whenever they're fighting, uh, because again, they, they, they fought in very close formations and people were slamming against them. They had to maintain that grip. Um, it's an attraction, so that way they're not sliding everywhere. Um, they did have a closed toe grain of this called um, uh, the calci, and uh, calci, again, are just pretty much a simple leather boot that's laced up in the same manner. And uh, they had wool on the inside. Again, pertinent to your environment. You wouldn't want to wear closed toe boots out in the middle of the desert. So. Um, but standard issue with the equipment whenever he's won in battle, um, the only thing he's missing here are two pilum. Now he would have a weighted pilum and a, and a simple pilum, but the thing about the pilum, um, I don't have any uh, accurate or up to period examples. There's an example over there, but it's simply a uh, reproduction um, using 
and steal them and whatnot. Uh, I do have authentic ones, but we did have a few of our reenactors uh, bail uh, due to fiscal reasons, um, so they're unable to bring their equipment, which I'd be able to effectively demonstrate. But he would carry those two people into battle. Um, so the thing about that was he, he threw those before engaging in making the grass grow, as I like to call it. Um, before he engaged in his sword and shield fighting, he would throw these pilon to, um, to engage the enemy's shields. Not necessarily to kill them, but of course, if it killed them, that's nice too. Um, <laughs> but the thing about the pilon is that it has a long tang on it. With a very, uh, it's got a pyramid at the top, so that way it pierces through, but it cannot be pulled out. <coughs> the tang was, was uh, forged in such a way that whenever it would go through, the weighted part of the pilon would bend it. So whenever, uh, I'll use this for, for example, if this was all the way through your shield, and you had it picked up, of course, it would, it would be more like this, because you have all this leverage right here. I mean, you might have a, you, you could have a, a 20 feet piece of styrofoam, but you're never, you're never able to hold it out straight. So, it's all about leverage and you know, simple physics. And the Romans understood that. So, Pelum bent upon impact, and uh, was not really able to be thrown back. So, instead of fumbling with the shield, they'll simply drop the shield, because they can't use it anymore. So, the, uh, that's why the Romans were able to effectively engage the enemy. Uh, we did have shields, because they simply eliminated them using the pilum. Um, but the biggest piece of this equipment here that you see is not only the legionary itself, because no weapon is effective without a trained infantryman behind it. Um, this shield right here is probably one of the most ingenuitive designs that the Romans ever produced, um, in my opinion. It, it has more, more purpose to it than any, any other article you see here. Uh, simply for the fact that it is both a defensive and an offensive weapon. Now, who might have any ideas as to why? What is the big thing you notice in the center of the shield? Yes, sir. Well, it's got that big raised boss that it's you can push and punch with. It's got that big raised boss right there. So who would want to be punched in the mouth with that? <laughs> Nobody. That's right. So this boss here was not only there to protect your hand, but again, you could you could punch somebody in the face with it. And trust me, I've done enough. We do live steal sometimes. Um, of course, not as safe as the Palmetto Knights by any means, but... I mean, what's reenacting with a little bit of blood? Um, <laughs> I've broken my nose from a boss like this before. Um, and I'll tell you, it's very effective. When, when you get hit in the face, you know, you're, 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 all right, man, that's it. You know, I don't know why I came out here. I think I'm going to go to Hardee's. Um, <laughs> okay. um, but yes, uh, but that's, that's, the big, that's the big part right here, is that this big, this big heavy boss. And this existed uh, even in the Polybian times. But the, the rectangular part of that scutum, well, it's called the scutum, by the way, not a scrotum. It's called a scutum. Um, the big part of that, again, is the boss. But this existed back in the Polybian times, uh, before the Marian reforms, the Polybian reforms, everything like that, the Roman army. Um, but the shields are more, more uh, angular um, in that time. But we'll go over that uh, at another time. Um, but you'll also notice on this shield is that it's edged with brass. Now, uh, they would sometimes edge it with brass or leather, depending on what is available. Of course, um, if leather is more available, we'll use that. If that's more available, um, it, of course, we'll go with that. But if you're a legion on the march, you can kill animals, but you can't start mining for stuff. You can't, you know, um, you might, if you have the resources, of course, they'd use it. Because every legion had a fabric of it. They had their own central issue facility. If any of my veterans are in here, they understand how heinous of a process that is. Um, but SIF, back then, was simply called the Fabrica Legionis. And this is where the legion's uh, slaves, unfortunately, they did have slaves back then. Um, the slaves and other blacksmiths that were actually hired by the legion, um, which they were called the Fabrica, uh, they would work on the equipment. Um, so. They would produce these shields uh, typically um, with strips. They would use these strips about an inch, inch and a half in width, and they would set multiple of them um, using some kind of glue, some kind of adhesive back then, um, over logs. Typically the, uh, the ashwood tree, that's typically the wood they used back then. Um, they would form it and mold it to this, uh, to this cylindrical shape, or this uh, half circle. Um, and you'll see why here in a minute whenever we get to, to the reason why the shield is shaped the way it is. Um, so, Again, this is your defensive and offensive weapon, but you notice that it covers most of his body, yes? He, most of him is not, is not exposed. So whenever he would be in battle, he would simply, this is about how he would have it, right? So if I was in Andrew's kit right now, what does that leave exposed? Me. Your eyes. Your eyes. It leaves my eyes exposed, okay. Legs. 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 And my legs, okay. So now let's go over the armament of the enemy at the time. Primarily, Rome's enemies came from the north. Um, Parthians and Eastern enemies typically did not uh, engage in incursions on Roman territory. The only um, southern enemy they really had to worry about was Carthage, and they were dealt with accordingly, if any of you are students of history. Um, so a lot of Rome's enemies came from the north. This includes, you know, all the tribes, such as the Nervi, the Cimbri, the Gauls, um, the Cherusci, um, you know, things like that. Um, uh, this, is, this is during um, the late Republican, early Imperial era. 
Um, and even even throughout the whole Republican era, uh, Gaul actually was able to sack Rome um, a few times. Um, uh, well, Roman cities primarily. Um, but Rome understood what kind of weapons they were going against. So a lot of the weapons back in the day, this is, of course, not a Gallic weapon. Um, I do not have any Gallic weapons at present or, or weapons of, of, of then, but they did, have, they did have long swords of sorts, some of them uh, being one-handed, some of them two-handed, but they were long. You'll notice that this isn't necessarily a sword that you want to thrust with. Yeah, just stay low, guys. <laughs> <laughs> some shit. Um, this isn't necessarily a sword that you can adequately, you know, engage somebody who's within a few feet with you. It's, it's something you have to utilize in, in, in a manner of, of length. So the Romans understood that. So while this guy right here has this shield, which covers most of his body, he has a short stabbing sword. This is called the gladius. This is the mites pattern. If Andrew could go ahead and shoot that. Uh, the mites pattern gladius, you notice it is a small, nasty little bastard. It's got a simple point to it, and that's for a reason. Um, so whenever I have to go in, so let's say we saw what's exposed here, right? We saw what's exposed. We have his eyes. So I can try and snap his eyes, but all he does is raise his shield, because if the unique part about the shield is that it's got a horizontal grip. So he's able to simply lift it up and down. Um, you'll notice a lot of these buckler shields and, and shields of uh, Renaissance and medieval eras um, have a grip that's, that simply extends along the arms. They, they can do all that, right? It's, it's more of this motion than number. Uh, but the Roman shield has a horizontal grip that provides you know, the ability to raise and lower it accordingly. Because that's all that's exposed on his body. Um, and he has men to his left and right, which we'll be going over that in a minute. But if I'm trying to go for his eyes, all he has to do is raise it, and then that leaves me exposed. And he's able to come around and stab me. And when that thing goes through your ribs, it, it destroys everything. That's mm. it. A, this is dull, uh, because I deal with children a lot. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I do go to high schools and whatnot, and unfortunately, children like to swing around sharp things. And uh, we, we've only been banned from one high school. Let's <laughs> <laughs> um, just say the student has several stitches. Um, so because of that, we decided to dull our blades and everything. Um, but, but in an actual scenario, this blade would be very, very sharp, and it would pierce me very deeply. And I would simply, I'd have traumatic blood loss right there. Um, I would probably lose consciousness very swiftly. And whenever I'm on the ground, all this dude has to do is step over me. He just steps right over me because I can't necessarily, on the ground, I can't just stab up because it's a long story. Um, they, they, you know, I'm, I'm losing blood, I'm going unconscious, so he steps in front of me, and the rank is typically five deep. So the guy behind him is like, oh. <laughs> and that's the end of the Gallic soldier. That's so, the sad end. So again, all their equipment is basically pertinent to who they were fighting um, and how the enemy fought. Um, during Trajan's uh, Dacian Wars, if any of you are familiar with that, um, when Trajan uh, decided to sack Sarmaz of Gattuso, um, one of the things he noticed was that the Dacians had a big weapon called the Falx. Another thing he noticed is that dudes were getting chopped in half. <laughs> so he, he decided to fix this um, because, again, whenever he goes to stab me, what comes out? His, his arm comes past the shield, right? Well, the Dacians, with their with their long falcs, they just see the arm, they're like, oh! And all of a sudden, all of a sudden the Roman soldier's done. He's like, well, shit. <laughs> so, with that in mind, um, Trajan decided to create manica, which was a segmented, much like the segmentata, it was segmented plates, typically made of uh, brass, uh, even bronze have been found, copper, um, or not so copper, um, and, and iron, uh, which segmented all the way down so that the falcs wasn't able to adequately pierce um, and cut off those arms. And on the helmets, I do not have any uh, metallic examples or, or later Gallic examples, um, but the helmets would have a, a steel, uh, like, sort of like a, a thick wire, but it's not a wire, it's, it's actually like a very a very thick um, bar, per se, that would go transverse and then front to back as well. Um, and that would protect, again, the helmet from being cut in half, because there are, there have been Roman soldiers found in Dacia who, their skull, and you may be like, oh, that's a Roman soldier, how do you know? Is his skulls in half? <laughs> and, and his skulls in half. And there's a there's a fal there's a falchion blade or a, a falx rather buried into his sternum. It went all the way from his head to his sternum. So the Romans understood that sometimes you know you got to make changes to your equipment in order to whip the enemy's ass. And Trajan did. And if any of you are students of history as well, you know that one of the few things up to Dacia is a lead pipe sticking out of a mountain. That's all that's up to Dacia. So. So, with that in mind, uh, what we're going to be doing is going into the formations. So all this equipment, of course, uh, the exposed bits are exposed for a reason. Because there would be several men to his left and right. The Romans fought in what is known as a centuria. All right? This is a, uh, a century. It is of, of 80 men. 
and then it is commanded by the centurion, which he didn't command 100 men, um, he commanded 80. Um, so the Roman centurion was in charge, he was like your modern day platoon leader. His platoon sergeant was the optio, which is, uh, in Latin it sounds a lot like option, that's because it was, because whenever a centurion dies, there's the option, the only option. Um, <laughs> he's, he's his platoon sergeant, so to speak, back then. Um, so those were the two guys in charge of it, and of course they had a religious uh, a standard bearer called a signifer, um, and then they also had a cornican who blew the horn, which is uh, one of the things I'll be bringing up um, is a popular theory uh, regarding the formations here in a minute. But in a century formation, it's typically five deep, um, and uh, that's for a reason. Um, so Roman soldiers in a battle uh, typically only fought for four to five minutes, and there's a reason for this. The battles were over very swiftly. Because the Romans understood that there had to be an economy of energy on the battlefield. Um, with that rank being five deep, they have reserves right behind them. So, Andrew, I'm going to have you switch to a notional shield. So, if you're going to just pull your hand out like that, you're going to step up there for me. So, a little bit further. So, I'm the guy behind. There you go. I'm the guy behind Andrew, right? I'm a Roman legionary. Let's see this. And Andrew is fighting the enemy. Now the cornican, I just mentioned the horn blower. Um, at the centurion's command, uh, the cornican gives simply a, you know, a, like a blast of the horn or something like that. You know, three for white walkers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he gives blast the horn, and that lets the front rank know that they get to go to the back and have a break. So all he does is simply step back to his left, tuck his shield in, and then I'm right behind him. And I've already got my shield raised. So whoever he was fighting, if they're not dead already, I just just like that. And, and uh, if he's not down, I've got him where he needs to be. And the people to my left and right have also came up to the line. So all we're doing is sitting there, and well, like I, sh like I showed you a minute ago, these guys have to swing around this long sword like it's nobody's business, like the Robert Baratheon sieging pipe, you know? Um, so they're doing all that, and all I have to do to kill a dude is that. <laughs> Real simple, right? You know, stick him with a pointy end. You know, um, <laughs> Real simple. You know, they get stabbed in the gut, they're dead. They get stabbed in the neck, they're dead. They, you know, they get stabbed in the groin, they're dead. Kind of simple. And that's the thing about this. Um, the Romans understood that economy of energy. So if the man was in the front rank and he only fought for four or five minutes and he went to the back, provided he survived, which likely he did, um, he wouldn't have to fight for another 40 to 45 minutes. Now, who here thinks that's an adequate break? Imagine if you were in the middle of a baseball, soccer, or football game and you got a 45 minute break between you and the next inning for uh, a quarter. You'd feel pretty juiced up, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. So by the time you come back, you've already had a nap. You filed your I-4 or W-4, and uh, you know you, you paid off your car. You know, <laughs> and I'm not implying there's cars back then. <laughs> don't, don't think that. People have asked me. People have asked me if there were cars because I made that joke before. So. <laughs> Sad part is not, not history is is becoming more of a uh, a lot of curricular. You know, people who um, write the curriculum for schools they are starting to focus less on history and more just getting you know the core things that happen pertinent to how we came to be, because America, am I right? <laughs> so pe people don't understand that, you know, how things, military history in particular, they don't understand uh, how things evolve over time. Mm -hmm. So uh, because of this, I've been called, I've been called uh, uh, pirates. Like whenever I'm wearing my full getup, I'll be, you know, at like a parade or a festival or something like that. And like, oh, look, it's the pirates. <laughs> or, or they're like, like oh, it's the Spartans, which is, I guess, is understandable. Or they'll look at me and, and uh, I've even been called a, a Waffen SS reactor. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, that's relevant, uh, a little bit of a tangent, um, but yes, um, again, yeah, that's my question. Um, again, it's all pertinent to that economy of energy. So the Romans being able to fight in the century formation, they were able to effectively engage the enemy, who for the most part did not have the, the discipline that the Roman army did, right? They knew to not, to not falter in battle because um, running from battle means that your unit could potentially be decimated. Or, or you simply just, for having ran, you'd have been killed yourself. Um, so the Romans were, were quite literally beat into them uh, by the centurion to, to not flee from battle. These men were these men were warriors by the time they stepped on the field because they've already been abused, they've already been, they've already had their food taken from them uh, whenever they mess up. And they, they train every day. When they're not fighting or patrolling or on duty, they're training. Or There's three things they do. They fight, they train, they sleep. That's what the Roman army did when they were on campaign. And uh, they would have another 50 to 100 pounds of gear that they would carry when they're on the march, and they would march 20, uh, 20 miles in five hours, carrying everything you see here and a lot more, a lot more. They would carry a delabra, they would carry um, extra rations, they would carry um, their pila, they would carry a pike to, the, to build their fortifications. 
Uh, they would carry um, uh, for their helmet would be on their chest. Um, they'd be carrying a lot of a lot of heavy stuff, a lot of the stuff that you carry when you travel. And because of this, they were called the Muli Mariani, which means Marius' mules. Because when Gaius Marius um, reformed the legions, before him, the Roman army was a bring your own equipment kind of thing. Imagine if you joined the army today, and, and next thing you know, you're going to Iraq, and you're in what you're wearing now. And then you ask your, your uh, platoon commander why, and he says, well, you didn't bring your stuff. You didn't buy your stuff. I mean, you, you know, that's how it was before Gaius Marius. It was a very class-based army. If you were somebody like 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 me, who who as as a broke you know broke young man who lives off the top ramen, you're gonna be showing up to battle, living uh, or in, in a tunic, literally just this. You would show up in a battle with just this, and you might be wondering, what the hell am I gonna do there? Well, that's a good question. So that's how they created the velites. The velites um, during the manipular uh, set of legions, which we're not gonna necessarily get into a tangent about, but that's an, just an example. The velites would literally be given. Uh, Sometimes sharpened sticks, or they would be, if they're, if they're really lucky, they would be given um, uh, small javelins to throw. But since they had no armor, no weapons, no equipment, their job was to run up to the enemy, come probably from about right here to, to the elevators, and chuck these spears and hope they don't get killed. And then whenever they all died, then they would move on to the Hastati, which were people who could afford a little bit of armor. And they would have a simply a metal plate right here, and, and, then, and then a shield. They, they at least had that much, and they had a sword. Um, and they had a helmet, but everything else was exposed. They just had a simple square plate. And then they, they had that helmet and that shield and that sword. And then, of course, as the lower class started dying and dying, um, in terms of battle, um, then they started you know, meeting more heavily armed people. Um, so by the time they got back to the Triarii, which were the pikemen, the full armor and you know, everything like that, these guys had spears. Um, these guys were uh, pretty wealthy, uh, veterans of many campaigns. Uh, these guys are old guys who can afford stuff. So whenever the enemy finally got to them, they're like, hm, hm, fuck you, man, I'm fucking this. All those guys died, you know? And it's that simple. Uh, so General Marius, Gaius Marius, uh, rather, he saw this and he decided to rectify it. So what he did was created a, a military treasury. But up until Augustus, this was pertinent to the generals. That's why Pompey and Caesar were able to fight their civil wars. That's why the first triumvirate happened. That's because generals provided the equipment, provided the money, everything like that and people were loyal to the generals. And Augustus decided to consolidate that and make an imperial treasury, much like our Federal Reserve, you know, our federal budget, uh, so that would fund their army. So Gaius Marius decided, though, either way, these men would be given equipment, they'd be given rations, they'd be given a salary, but because of that, they could sign on for an enlistment of no less than 25 years. So imagine, imagine if you went to the recruiting station or war broke out, and let's say if you joined um, during Desert Storm, uh, say you joined in 1991 during Desert Storm. <laughs> You'd have gotten out of the army last year. Now, I'm not, so, but again, you, you win some, you lose some, I guess. Um, <laughs> and, but once you're in the army, there's no getting out. Uh, they, they, of course, had their own version of getting in, uh, or MEPS, rather, uh, physical standards. Um, if you had, you know, no fingers, I mean, you can't really get in. Um, that's just an example. Um, but the people who could get in, once you're in the army, you can't get out because of punishment was the cross, simply. You'd be crucified, or you'd be stoned to death, or you'd be strangled, or you'd be beat to death by your friends. And I'm sure nobody wants to do that. Um, so that's why the Roman soldiers are so disciplined in battle. Um, but again, uh, the formations, going back on that, I went off on a big tangent, just realized. Um, again, they fought those century formations. That meant they were able to flank and engage and destroy the enemy. Uh, the centuries were known as manifolds beforehand. So um, whenever Rome decided to attack Greece and went against them. The reason why they won against the phalanx was because the maniples were able to outmaneuver them. Because when you have a bunch of guys like this, um, well, of course, during the, during the Greek and Roman wars, uh, they didn't have this kind of equipment, but they did have you know, the, sh the shield and the sword, and they were able to move on their equipment. Five minutes? No. They were able to move on their equipment um, rather swiftly. Um, they were able to outmaneuver them. So, um, again, it's all about maneuverability. So they fought in those century formations. What do they do on the flanks, like on the sides? On the flanks? Uh, that's a good question. So the Roman legions spanned about 6,000 men. So that's, that's, a, that's a long way that way, a long way that way. But on top of which, they would double that number through auxiliaries, people who weren't Roman citizens. These men were issued to the same degree, the same kind of equipment. Um, but at the end of their servitude, they got Roman citizenship. Um, so the auxiliaries partic particularly uh, protected the flanks because they were trained primarily with using spears um, or, or cavalry or uh, range weaponry, um, 
such as bows or, or even mount or fixated pieces if they were in a siege. So the auxiliary would typically handle that stuff. Um, I was just notified of the time hack, um, and it's my fault when I tangent a little bit, but um, if we have any questions, now would be the time. You've spoken quite a bit about uh, discipline in the Roman army. Yep. Um, could you speak a little bit about the other great Roman virtue of virtus, or martial fury, uh, that is often said is the complementary yet contradictory element that made Rome so successful uh, until it wasn't? That's right. So, and quite, quite literally, the Roman religion was based upon warfare. The entirety of it, everything could be could come back to that core root of warfare and the expansion of the state. So with that in mind, it, every Roman, every Roman uh, male felt that it was his duty to serve the state in some degree or another. So that would be um, through servitude in the military, that would be through politics, um, but those who went through the martial route, um, it, it quite literally was a religious sacrilege um, to, to, in, in violation of, of Mars, um, which is the Roman god of war, to not draw blood of the enemy, to, to, to falter in battle, to not have that, that warrior ethos per se. Uh, the men back then, it, they had a lot, lot more weapons to go. I could elaborate that more on uh, here shortly. I uh, just gotta get some more questions in. Go ahead. What, what caused the Roman antagonism to the bow? They could have used it in very, like versus Carthage, versus the Parthians, the Sassanids. Are you you're speaking about a uh, ranged weaponry? Yes. Um, well, it's just a, it's simply a matter of the fact that they didn't really have that. Uh, well, they did have the equipment, of course. I guess it was provided at later dates. But this is simply how the buildup of, of the legions were at that time. Um, the velites, the, you know, they weren't necessarily about pulling back the bow. They had, of course, those javelins like I spoke to. Um, I'm, unable, I'm unable to elaborate as to why they didn't issue the people who were in the Velites um, bows or whatnot, but they did uh, alleviate that through the usage of the Allied cohorts, which are the auxiliaries, um, during the Imperial era. Um, so How often did they clean their equipment? How often did they clean their equipment? All right, so during their inspections, um, which are typically held, I guess, after, after March or so on, for in garrison, um, it was, of course, expected of them to have serviceable equipment and equipment that works. So I'd say whenever they weren't fighting or training, in between those times, they would clean that and then go to sleep. So Thank during their off-duty time. So they're probably a daily thing, I'd imagine. Yes, sir. You mentioned the horns, which is often how oh, maneuver yeah. commands were given. Yes. If you got horns at the at the um, century level, mm -hmm. and then the whole legion, how do you tell on a battlefield? Which command, which horn is for me, which horn is not? How do, how do you break that, those lines of communication out? Well, the cornican would be held, of course, like more in the central area within the century. And uh, battle is very loud, of course, with all these yelling mm -hmm. men, all these clashing swords and everything like that. So uh, sound will not necessarily travel very far. So again, you have to rely on the people around you, your battle to take care of you, and so on and so forth. So um, I personally am not able to speak as to how they might have alleviated that. But it has been documented that they did use the cornican to, um, to, to change up the ranks. Uh, the spear was mainly, you don't throw a spear. Uh, the spear was primarily used against cavalry, um, and then anti-cavalry maneuvers or, or defenses or so on. Again, those are, these are flank weaponry. Um, so, uh, so you don't throw the spear. The javelin, you just simply threw it. And I got time for maybe one or two more questions. Yes? Uh, so the PLA, if they had two of them, where did they hold, where did they carry them on the march? Uh, on the march, it's simply holster? just like over the shoulder, like a hobo. <laughs> they, uh, they, 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 uh, on the march, whenever they're heading between places, mm -hmm. um, whenever they had to carry all their equipment, they simply wrapped it all up and carried everything in a sack, much like the modern day hobo pole. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's strange looking, but it works. Uh, any other questions? All right, so if anybody has any questions, uh, stick around uh, after. I got another panel immediately after this because we turned away quite a bit of people. But I thank you all for your time. I hope you learned something. Thank you. Thank you.